Hello everyone, I hope you are healthy and focused and ready to finish uh, the rest of this semester. As you know, we are going to go online. So for the rest of the lectures and for the rest of the course and semester, uh, this course will be, the lectures will be recorded and posted on YouTube. And then you will get the link in order to go watch, take notes. And in addition, you will get the PDF of the presentations so a combination of the lectures and PDF can help you you know understand the content so if you remember we were talking about uh, parts or section 7 and we were talking about heat pipes and mechanically pumped fluid loops so in the class we actually finished the long section on the heat pipes but we didn't get the, a chance to start mechanically pump fluid loops so in this lecture therefore I'm going to cover only the last part the mechanically pumped fluid loops so for heat pipes please go back to the PDFs as they were already taught in the class So as usual, these are the reading sources and references. And for this particular section, the mechanically pumped fluid loops, I have actually gathered the information from here and there. So it's not necessarily from a particular book. So we mentioned about the various spacecraft thermal management architectures and we said that the thermal control components can be categorized as passive or active thermal control so for passive systems or components with no moving parts we can think of like sunlight reflecting coatings or optical coatings that we talked about in the previous lectures insulation blankets or multi-layer uh, insulation MLI sun shields for the cases where we want really low temperatures cryogenic applications for telescopes for infrared uh, cameras phase change materials that we did not unfortunately cover but there are other types of passive uh, uh, thermal management systems we talked about thermal uh, straps simply uh, metal connections in order to transfer heat from one point to the other and we also talked about radiators and the job of the radiators is to reject the heat to the space then we said that some other systems are semi-active or active meaning that they may have moving parts or at least moving fluids so examples are like or mo even moving electrons so examples are like heaters they do need they are powered so they are active louvers they do have uh, mechanically actuated parts we talked about heat pipes heat pipes they do not what well, is interesting heat pipes can be considered as passive and also as active so they are passive because they do not have uh, mechanically moving parts but they are active in a sense because they do have fluids moving through so usually the heat pipes are considered as passive but I put it in the semi-active or active systems because they do uh, fluid actually runs through the system so it is definitely heat pipes are more uh, complicated than thermal straps if you want to see the difference so heat pipes may fail because of that liquid so that's I mean that's that's why they need additional care compared to totally passive systems then we do have pumped fluid loops PFLs that we will talk about today thermoelectric coolers that use the thermoelectric or uh, effect or Seebeck effect Peltier effect and cryogenic coolers which are actually vapor compression for instance system so they do transfer heat 
based on the second law of thermodynamics. So they transfer heat from low temperature to high temperature, this cryogenic uh, system. So, all right. So before I actually start talking about the pump fluid loops, I do have another background that we have talked about before, but it's a refresher. So you remember, we remember that for heat removal systems, we can think of two different philosophies and two different realities. One is regarded as refrigeration, and that's when we want to transfer heat from low temperature to high temperature. Low temperature to high temperature. So it's against the nature. So in this case, delta T is negative. So because it's against the nature and against the thermodynamics, so we do require input energy in order to make that happen. So systems under this refrigeration are vapor compression cycle, like the cycle used in residential air conditioners or in uh, household refrigerators. Also absorption cycle for large chillers. They do not use a, a compressor. Instead, they use waste energy to run the cycle. Also reverse Brighton gas cycle using aircrafts and uh, thermoelectric or Peltier cooling. So this system actually, or the thermoelectric cooling can be used for like cryogenic applications and also vapor compression can be used for cryogenic applications when we really need a very low temperature in the spacecraft, something that cannot be achieved by simply using thermal straps, heat pipes or uh, pumped fluid loops. So that brings us to the second type, which is cooling. So in the case of cooling, heat removal occurs from high temperature, from a high temperature reservoir to a low temperature reservoir. So delta T is positive. It's in a natural process. As a result, no additional input work is needed because heat naturally transfers from high temperature to low temperature. Now the question is the how to promote this natural process so that the components do not get overheated. So some of the known methods are like convective cooling by a fan, like cooling the CPU of a computer, laptop, data centers. That's just simply using a fan, we can promote the convection process. Evaporative cooling, such as evaporative air coolers and spray generators, another form, but not very, you know, uh, not commonly used. It has a special applications. And then what is commonly used in spacecrafts uh, is like heat pipes that we have talked about. It's also used in uh, ground applications, such as in laptops, electronics, and finally, mechanically pumped fluid loops, which can be used to actively uh, create a flow of heat from one component to the other and all the way to the radiator if needed. So the topic of today's lecture, mechanically pumped fluid loops. So there is a video here, so I will not run the supplementary videos, you go ahead and run them. The links are available in the uh, PDF of the lecture. So a pumped fluid loop is a system that provides transfer of a large, usually a large amount of heat between two points by means of forced liquid. So the liquid is forced by a pump or by multiple pumps passing through tubes delivering convective cooling. So we often say that in this space there is no convection, but actually there is no convection outside, I mean, outside of the components or in this, no convection between the components and the space, but convection can be present 
internally okay so how does it work if this is the heat transfer generated in the electronics then a fluid such as you know a, you know a fluid that does not freeze for instance at this uh, at the condition of the space such as uh, methanol ethanol uh, refrigerants so a fluid is flown through the uh, circuit it receives or picks up heat from the electronics a pump is used to overcome the pressure drop in the system and if needed if the temperature is low is high and some of this heat has to be rejected then the fluid will go through the radiator and as it passes through the radiator it will reject heat to the space and then the cycle continues so pump fluid loop can be used for both terrestrial and space applications so for instance tesla model s and in general tesla electric cars actually use uh, pump fluid loop to cool their battery pack so here for tesla model s you see the battery packs these are just uh, conventional cylindrical uh, lithium ion batteries and in order to cool them or in order to actually distribute or evenly distribute the heat among these large packs of batteries a coolant like a glycol coolant is flown in it passes through the battery packs or different modules and then it exits the system at the end of the battery pack so but the pump fluid loop actually does have applications other than space applications as you see so there is a lot of information available on this therefore however when we should also take into account that the environment on this on the earth in the atmosphere is different from the environment in the space for instance in the case of this tesla model s you could say that since the air is available between the battery uh, each battery cell and also the battery modules and components so natural convection is all is available so heat transfer therefore between the the fluid loop and the batteries will be different from the heat transfer between the fluid loop and components in the spacecraft so what are the main components of the pump fluid loop so this is a like a model of a pump fluid loop the main components like the structure of the fluid loop not showing the components of the spacecraft so it is comprised of like one or more pumps like a primary pump and backup pumps in case of failure tubes in order to connect and carry the fluid isolation valves before and after a pump usually an isolation valve is used to replace the pump or control the flow rate an important component is a three-way valve three-way valve is needed to decide whether the fluid needs to be sent to the radiator to reject heat or if the temperature of the fluid is actually too low it has to be sent to additional heaters in order to elevate the temperature another component is the accumulator this big tank here which can be heavy so accumulator is used to compensate for leakage and maintain a constant pressure in the loop so this is sometimes called, called a search tank it's sometimes used like to prevent a water hammer so in the pump fluid loop it is used to basically provide liquid when needed or absorb the liquid when it's not needed so that's the there is a mounting plate so the mounting plate that basically accommodates all components it's a rigid plate and every 
component has to be mounted on this. In order to have a robust system, couplings and fittings between the different components of the system and the coolant, uh, such as the water. If water, well, it's not usually used for space applications because it may, it will, there is a high chance of freezing in the radiator part. Methanol, which has a lower uh, freezing point, and so on. There is another video here that I suggest to go ahead and watch. This is another, this is a schematic of a pump fluid loop with redundant pumps. So from European Space Agency. So here we do have the components we talked, most of the components that we talked about in the previous slide. Here the fluid comes in. Let's say the fluid uh, comes in, the fluid that has already gone through the electronics. Now it comes to the heart of the pump fluid loop. It comes to the pump area. So as the fluid comes in, then it enters. So here you see two pumps. So we do have redundant pumps in order to improve the, re the reliability of the system. So these are the two pumps. Usually one of these pumps is in the system. The other one is just a backup pump. So it's not in use unless needed. So, so this is the case like for the International Space Station. Recently one of the pumps failed and then the other pump was turned on and the astronauts actually fixed the other pump to make sure that always two pumps are available in case one of them fails the other one will be immediately uh, turned on and then do the job all right so now let's say that the fluid passes through the primary pump so passes through the valve the valve is open and then through this pump and then here there is a temperature sensor in the three-way valve in the three-way valve, I could, based on the temperature of the fluid which is coming in, it is decided whether it has to go to the heater or it has to go toward the radiator. So if the temperature of the fluid which is coming in is low, for instance, let's say it's during the night time, during the eclipse. So if the temperature of the fluid is low, then it will be directed to additional heaters in order to raise the temperature. However, if, if it's during the day or during the time that there is a lot of heat rejection and the temperature is higher than a set point, set temperature, the fluid will be directed toward the radiator in order to reject the heat. And these electronic boxes control, so obviously because it, this is an active system, so the three-way valve, the pump itself, the sensors, uh, and so on are actually powered. So electronics are used to control the process. So pump fluid loops have been used in uh, multiple systems so mainly a pump fluid loop is because it's a is an active uh, usually massive system it is usually used for manned or crewed flights such as international space station or space shuttle so that if something goes wrong the astronauts can go ahead and fix it or because in such large spacecraft such as International Space Station, there is a lot of heat load that has to be dissipated and using only passive systems such as heat pipes may not be reasonable. So the ballpark figure is that basically the pump fluid loop is used for large systems and for manned or crewed spacecrafts. However, if, if, if we can actually find the reliable pumps, if reliable pumps can be developed, 
so that they do not fail they can continue to operate you know for you know even years or months then the pump fluid loop can be used for unmanned spacecrafts as well such as the mars pathfinder mars rover and science lab and similar other systems so pump fluid loops are usually used for large spacecrafts mainly manned but it's possible to be used for unmanned spacecraft as well some examples so this is the mars rover and the science lab <clears throat> so basically so the spacecraft and the rover so we do have the spacecraft part of it that carries uh, the, the the rover to the Mars surface so both of them utilize mechanically pumped single phase so the uh, fluid loop can be single phase or multi-phase if it's single phase they means that there will be no phase change it's a simpler system and perhaps more reliable but if there is phase change in the system of course it's more efficient in terms of the level of heat transfer because heat transfer can be enhanced during phase change so the mars rover and science lab use single phase fluid loop heat rejection systems and both of them use actually refrigerant 11 as the working fluid so here it's the schematic of the system so of the loop itself so these are the electronics the heat given to the electronics it does have bypass system so this bypass system is like the three-way valve that we talked about before so that would be like the or the bypass valves that you see here so here you see that that's the heat source so this is like the additional heaters that we may want to use if the temperature is if the temperature of the liquid after the electronics is low then it may actually go through additional heat source or a heater in order to pick up some heat to increase the temperature so this part may be bypassed if the if there is no need for the additional heater so that's the job of this bypass valve so this is like the three-way valve then it enters the pump either directly from electronics or after passing through a heater and then after the pump then it has to be decided whether uh, the, the fluid has to go through the radiators in order to reject heat or it has to actually come back to the electronics again so basically if it has gone through the heat sources additional heaters then it means that it, it's, it's not supposed to go through the radiator so like this red part of the circle so it has to follow this red part so it's just electronics heaters back to electronics then the blue part is that like during the day if the fluid is hot it goes through the blue part it has to go through the pump and then it will go through the radiator in order to reject heat and here it's the place of the the pump fluid loop that we see on the spacecraft so it is also called a thermal bus and the reason is that it supplies or rejects heat using bypass function so so it means that it's like a bus you know that people can get off and get in so whenever heat is needed so the job of the fluid loop is actually to distribute the heat and if need and also share the heat so for instance the heat can be shared between different components of the electronics if one component generates a lot of heat the other one actually needs heat so the heat will be shared between different components so one advantage of the flu pump fluid loop is actually the heat sharing capability or the thermal bus function so another example is the international space station which is actually a huge spacecraft huge satellite 
So most probably most of the uh, heating are uh, most of thermal management architectures that we have talked about are used in the International Space Station. But here our focus is on the heat uh, pumped fluid loop. So let's focus on that. But before that, we see a lot of insulations used in International Space Station. It is essentially covered with multi-layer multi, multi -layer insulation, MLI, that you see in the picture, in order to isolate the interior of the spacecraft from the, the exterior of the spacecraft in order to keep a environment uh, suitable for the astronauts because it's a manned spacecraft and the temperature must remain between like a level a temperature range so that the astronauts do not sweat or do not get too cold and so on so beside insulations the international space station actually uses a uh, heat rejection system which is based on two pump systems so one is water run so water run tubes extract heat from the devices inside the ISS. Inside the ISS there are many sources of heat generation from astronauts to the electronics, different components, different uh, labs, modules, computers, cameras and so on. So then this water run tube extracts heat and then the heat is transferred to an ammonia run heat exchanger. So inside the inside the iss because the temperature remains at the room temperature so it's water run because water doesn't freeze there then using a heat exchanger the heat is transferred to an ammonia run heat exchanger so it's not it's indirect heat transfer there's no contact between water and ammonia so then heat is given to the ammonia run heat exchanger and the heated ammonia then circulates through radiators mounted on the exterior of the International Space Station releasing the heat as infrared radiation. So it's low temperature uh, thermal radiation in the infrared zone. <clears throat> so then these are the radiators of the International Space Station. They are painted white. This is like an optical coating in order to reject the solar irradiation and at the same time radiate at the infrared range. So in the section of, we covered that in the optical coating section. So there is also a video here for you to watch for additional information and we will have a some of working on international space station so i'll try to make uh, term papers and presentations available to everyone so this is the schematic of design of a pump fluid loop so this is actually based on what we have talked about so far. So let's say we do have multiple electronic boxes like a computer, avionic boxes, GPS, uh, communication, data, uh, uplink, downlink, link, different electronics. So there are many. Then these boxes need to operate at certain temperature range so they cannot become too hot they cannot become too cold so therefore they need to transfer heat back and forth with the main uh, fluid in the pump fluid loop so what you see here is the main tubing running through this electronics so the pod, the tubes cannot run through the electronics the, directly therefore the electronics must be the electronics must be mounted on like a cold plate or on a plate on a support and then the tubes will run through the support like an aluminum like uh, cold plates 
So therefore, from one side, heat will be transferred between the electronics to the cold plate, for instance, using heat pipes, or they may be directly mounted on top of the cold plate. Then as a result, heat will be conducted. Heat will be conducted to the cold plate. Then from the cold plate, heat has to be transferred to the fluid inside the tubes. And that has to be done by convection. And convection is equal to, in terms of the thermal resistance, is delta T over the total resistance. The total resistance consists of uh, conduction of the tube walls, uh, thermal conduct resistance, and the convection resistance itself. So that's the heat transfer between the electronic boxes and the fluid loop. So first, by conduction from the boxes to the cold plate or to the heat sink, and then from the heat sink or cold plate to the fluid, it heat is transferred by convection. Then after each junction here, and as a result of uh, transfer of heat, Q, then the temperature of the fluid, which is passing through or running through the, the circuit, the, the pipes will increase. And that delta T increase of the temperature is equal to Q, the heat transfer which was just received by convection, divided by MC, the thermal capacitance of the fluid. So as a result, before and after this uh, this part of the heat sink, the temperature will increase or decrease. But it's the, the, the change in the temperature is not substantial. And then it enters uh, the next electronic box and the next associated heat sink and uh, the next one and so on and so forth. So, so this fluid then passes through the pump assembly that we saw in the previous slides. The main component of this pump assembly beside the pump itself is a three-way valve. In the three-way valve, the temperature of the fluid is compared against a set temperature. That set temperature could be, for instance, room temperature 20 degrees C. If the temperature is less than the set temperature, so it means that the fluid is cold. It means that most of these electrons actually do need heat. So as a result, the fluid will enter heaters, like re resistive resistance heaters, in order to increase the temperature of the fluid. And then the fluid will pass through the electronics, through the heat sinks or cold plates. So in this case, the cold plate is actually a hot plate because electronics will receive their required heat from it. So, Back to the three-way valve, if the temperature of the fluid at this point is higher than the set temperature, higher than the maximum temperature, right? This set temperature has a minimum and maximum. So probably I should have uh, put this as T set minimum, and this is actually T set maximum. So this T set minimum could be, let's say, 10 degrees C. T set maximum could be, let's say, 40 degrees C. So if the temperature is too high for the electronics, then the fluid will go through the radiator and it will dissipate heat to the surrounding and then comes back to the electronics. So here we also, in order to size the pump, we need to calculate the pressure drop in the part in the uh, in the loop so the pressure drop would be the pressure drop consists of the friction loss in the pipes plus the minor losses because the fluid passes through multiple valves passes through coupling bends junctions and so on so in order to design it, we need to start from, for instance, a reasonable 
pipe diameter something which is not too big because there is restriction in the thermal subsystem and also the thermal subsystem has to be designed back and forth in collaboration with other subsystems so you may not be allowed to actually use tubes with any size that you wish so it has to be reasonable the tubes have to be uh, embedded in the heat sink or in the cold plate so the tube diameter cannot be actually too big so after choosing the tube diameter uh, after uh, choosing the tube diameter then the the flow rate has to be determined based on the requirements of the heat transfer uh, usually the velocity in the tubes has to be kept in the turbulent region in order to maximize the heat transfer and minimize the pressure loss and based on the set Reynolds number which this defines basically the velocity of the fluid in the pipes we can calculate the flow rate and then <clears throat> Uh, with having the flow rate we can calculate the heat loss we can plot the uh, system care for the pump and then decide what's the operating uh, normal operating point of the system and then choose the pump accordingly so there are some additional details that I did not put here such as the uh, system thermal system curve and then uh, the, the operating point of the system. So some additional points here about the piping or tube sizing. So usually aluminum tubes are used for heat transfer between the tubes and the heat sources and heat sinks. So when we want to transfer heat, like in the cold plate, and between the electronics and cold plates aluminum tubes are the best because they do have low thermal con low thermal resistance i mean in, in terms of the in the tube uh, walls and then for the connection between different components the stainless steel tubes are used in most of the uh, parts of the fluid loop we actually just need to connect one part to the other the goal is not heat transfer so stainless steel tubes are used you know in the rest of the in the rest of the loop and pressure drop is calculated by darcy weisbach equation that we talked about in the previous slide so when you want to calculate the friction loss delta h let's say in a horizontal wall it is obtained by uh, this equation Darcy or Darcy Weisbach equation so the tube length tube diameter velocity of the fluid 2g and this friction coefficient is obtained from the Moody chart or Moody diagram that we will show in the next slide so this head loss is actually equal to the head loss to the head that has to be compensated by the pump although this is the head loss only by the major losses so the minor losses when added to this then it will become equal to the head which is supposed to be compensated by the pump so from fluid mechanics uh, a refresher and then we said that we do have convection between the electronics and actually between the heat sink or cold plate and the fluid in the tubes or in the pipes and that's forced convection for the turbulent region uh, the details bolter correlation can be used to find the new set number and therefore uh, based on new set number we can find the convection heat transfer coefficient so that's Reynolds number, Prandtl number, range of validity of this, and this is for Reynolds based on the hydraulic diameter more than 10,000. So this is a, for a fully turbulent flow, which is recommended because for this case, the friction factor is minimized and heat transfer 
increases with an increase in the Raynor's number. So this is the Moody diagram to find the friction factor, the F that have we had in the darcy Weisbach equation. So in order to find the friction factor, we need to start with a desired Raynor's number such as 10,000 that we had in the previous slide. 10,000 is 10 to the 4. So this is like the Raynor's number on this line. And then the rest of it is like what is the roughness of these of the tubes that we are using. So most tubes, so here is the roughness of the tubes are listed here, like for cast iron, for stainless steel. So the roughness can be read from this chart or from the manufacturer data sheet. Then with the given Rayner's number, so let's say that would be the Rayner's number. And then let's say for the given roughness, so let's say our roughness is on this line. So this vertical line shows the relative pipe roughness, the roughness of the pipe divided by the diameter of the pipe. Let's say we are at this roughness of zero at 0 0.01. Then we can go ahead and estimate the friction factor between 0 0.4 and uh, 0.04 and 0.05. Then we plug in in the darcy Weisberg equation in order to find the friction loss. And then we need to consider the minor loss as well. And the sum of that would be equal to the uh, head of the pump. So for then we can actually change we can go ahead and change this Raynor's number, make it larger and smaller, and then obtain a range of the friction losses and a range of the head losses in the system so that we have a sense of how the, the pressure loss in the system changes. So we also need to know the pump curve. So when we create these changes, of the pressure losses in the system, we can draw the system curve. And then based on having the curve of the pump, we can decide what is the operating point of the system. So this is a probably advanced topic. Either you have seen it in fluid mechanics or uh, this is, a, you can just follow the system curves, and pump curves in order to find the operating point of the system. So one last, well, one, one other thing is, the one important other thing here is the thermal contact resistance. So we said that the pump fluid loop tubes are embedded in a cold plate. And then heat is transferred between the cold plate and the fluid inside these tubes. So it means that we need to connect the tubes to the cold plate. So if they are either embedded or somehow attached or embedded in order to improve the heat transfer. <laughs> so regardless of the approach for cooling heating of each component, we need to create an effective interface between the component and the, and the thermal bus, such as the cold plate. So however, between each two surface, as you see here, because the surfaces are in fact rough, it is very difficult to have a very perfect contact. So, but this contact has to become as perfect as possible in order to reduce or minimize the thermal contact resistance. Because if there is a very rough contact between the two surfaces, air will be <clears throat> trapped it between the gaps in a space there is no air air will be will escape probably and then we will have vacuum so the heat transfer is compromised if there is not a good contact between the two surfaces the surfaces of the heat sink or cold plate and the surface of the the tubes so therefore connection is done 
by press fitting in order to you know create a very good connection press fitting the tube inside the sink or sometimes it can be done or assisted by conducting epoxy so epoxy conductive epoxies are made in order to fill the gaps between the two surfaces so conduction epoxy can be used and can be assisted with uh, press fitting or by applying pressure in order to reduce the thermal contact so the thermal contact resistance can be very sensitive with respect to the method of connection so here to show the sensitivity we do have aluminum aluminum slabs like flat plates put on top of one another and if we apply a pressure this is the contact pressure if we apply a pressure then as we change as we increase the pressure then the thermal resistance changes and this changes dramatically and these are log scales so it means that if we increase like the contact pressure if we make the contact pressure three times then the contact resistance decreases 10 times so it's very sensitive to the to the contact pressure and if the connection between the tubes and the heatsink is not good enough then actually the the pump fluid loop will not work effectively because it cannot do its job it cannot transfer the heat from the electronics to the fluid and then the heat will be accumulated in the electronic boxes and the temperature will go beyond the allowable temperature range so this part is very important and this what you see here a heat transfer refresher how to write the heat transfer in terms of the thermal circuits in this particular case you we have heat transfer between the interior of the tube and the like the outside let's say air is blown over a tube so here we do have the con resistance because of conduction conduction inside the pipe resistance because of conduction outside of the pipe by air and in the middle we do have the resistance because of the tube wall conduction resistance so however in this particular case the thermal resistance has not been shown so it's often time in the design people assume that the contact resistance is perfect and put the value of zero for the thermal contact resistance so that means that that would be like perfect thermal contact but in reality that can actually be very different and can change the the end result the the thermal contact resistance so one last thing that i would like to talk about in this section pump fluid loop is the accumulator that we said it's a component of the pump fluid loop so a hydraulic accumulator stores fluid so this is they look like this like a cylinder they store fluid under pressure so this is the hydraulic fluid such as like the fluid which is in the loop so let's say here is the pump fluid loop it's attached to one of these uh, cylinders so the hydraulic fluid is the same as the fluid of the loop for instance methanol or ethanol or ammonia so and then it's under pressure it's under pressure by another by a gas such as nitrogen so there is a piston in between so the piston is like frictionless so the amount of the depending on what is the pressure in the uh in the gas nitrogen here then the level then the piston can move up and down or it's let's put it another way if let's say fluid from the if there is some small leakage in the system in the pipeline then some of the liquid will be absorbed by the pipe will move to the pipe and the level of the fluid will be adjusted because the gas 
will be expanded and its pressure will decrease. So accumulators can take a specific amount of fluid under pressure and store it. The fluid is then released when it's required to perform a specific task in the hydraulic system. Accumulators can provide several functions such as energy storage, such as in the case of water hammer. So if there is a, a shock in the system, hydraulic shock in the system, they can absorb the energy and then gradually release it. Compensation of leakage, if there is some small leakage, not too much leakage, if the pump fluid lube is continuously leaking in the space, then it means that it's not working and essentially it will run out of uh, liquid and will stop working. Compensation of a small amount of leakage, compensation of temperature fluctuations, Cushioning of pressure shock, a water hammer that I talked about, which may occur at sudden switching of the valves. So when the switches are turned off suddenly, then the pressure in the system suddenly can want to increase. That's called the water hammer. So these accumulators can temporarily, momentarily absorb the energy and then release it so that the system comes back to equilibrium and dampening of dampening vibrations so they can somehow this uh, damp vibration because they are like a capacitor they are absorber so these are all of the explanations that i talked about in the previous slide so that's the compressed gas accumulator again there are multiple types of accumulators so the one that you see here, it's a accumulator which is which operates using a, a compressed gas. The gas fills in and then the valve is closed. And then, uh, <clears throat> so there is also a video here for you to watch. I think I talked about everything here. And this is a space grade accumulator. So in this space, the challenge is the restriction in, in the mass of the system. So accumulators could be quite massive. So for space applications, they have to be uh, you know, designed in such a way to reduce the mass as much as possible. So this is a ACT's accumulator, Advanced Cooling Technologies company, installed in NASA's cloud aerosol transport system operated for the life of the mission on the ISS. So, so ISS has a section for testing, uh, for testing different components of future missions. So individual parts are seen on the left, so individual parts of the accumulator, and the welded assembly is seen on the right. So that's also the link to this accumulator for a space application. So it's made of aluminum. It's, uh, if I'm not mistaken, the color suggests that it's made of aluminum. And it's uh, like a small scale, so it can uh, save mass. All right, so that brings us to the end of this PPT, the pumped fluid loop. So we talked about everything here. So a lot of important things regarding the pump fluid loops. So I guess most of the things that I wanted to cover has been covered. If you do have questions, please uh, write comments under the video or send emails or use the course forum and other means in order to uh, ask and share your questions and you I will be answering your questions. Thank you for your attention and we'll see you in the next lecture soon.